How's Keir Starmer doing then, Steve? Well, Keir, I, I can't hide my disappointment and I'm not going to from you either, to be honest with you. I mean, look, Keir was elected and, and I'm a Democrat. I'm a socialist, I'm a, but I'm a Democrat. And Keir was elected just about a year ago now, but he was elected on a number of promises, a number of pledges that he'd made. And he seems to be disappointed on a daily basis in terms of fulfilling those promises, to be fair. I mean, I don't think anybody in the nation wanted to see, you know, a political game of ping pong being played during the course of the pandemic. This was an opportunity for the nation to come together and for politicians to come together in the defence of our national interests. And, you know, medicine should be nationalised just as water and rail and public transport more generally should be. But it's not. It's in the hands of the private sector, of course. And Keir, I think it was an interesting point that David made in your earlier conversation. Keir made that choice, really, to allow government to disengage from Westminster. And therefore, Labour's become more and more irrelevant as the debate has become more and more limited inside the House. But Keir's made deliberate choices, not just internally, and that's quite obscene, the, the, the level of attacks that we're seeing on ordinary Labour Party members across our country right now in CLPs trying to raise, you know, discussions on you know, sensitive issues. Absolutely. But issues that should be at the heart of a Democratic Party to be able to have a debate about suspending whole CLPs and members for doing that or even raising the sceptre of a debate. Uh, it is is just wrong. It's just wrong. It's got to stop. What Keir did with uh, Jeremy, of course, has got to be put right. Jeremy's got to be installed back into the parliamentary Labour Party. The NEC made a decision to end that suspension and it was quite disgraceful that the agreement that was actually reached behind the scenes to allow that to happen was then disregarded by Keir personally, who then suspended him from the PLP. So all of these internal issues need to be resolved because what people don't want to see is internal naval gazing. They want to see a clear vision for a future and a future that gives them the security that they need for not just themselves, but their kids and their parents and coming generations as well. And that kicks back into what we're trying to do with the Green New Deal um, about our public services, the outrageous 1% offer, which is effectively a pay cut to our nursing staff, our NHS heroes. But of course, more importantly, millions of other key workers are getting nothing, nothing from the government. It's all just completely um ignored so you know i think here needs to step up to the plate we need to generate a very clear distinctive vision for our party moving forward and we need to get out in our communities it is closed down the community organizing project which is a big mistake uh in my view to be honest with you because we need to take our ideas we've got a fantastic manifesto in 2017 built on in 2019 that didn't lose us the 2019 election that really was more of a brexit election than anything else. The ideas in there were incredibly popular with the electorate. We just didn't get the time to have that discussion on the doorstep with them about them or in our workplaces. So we need to stop talking to ourselves. We need to stop the infight. People don't like that. They won't vote for a party that's infighting. We need to get out in our communities and build that movement, actually, that was spoken about earlier as well, that broad movement and inspire and motivate people to come home to Labour to come home to Labour. We're a distinctive party. We've got a clear vision for a future that's based on the needs of people as well as, um, you know, society more generally. But people, people are the centre of uh, our economy. They're the centre of our nation. They're what the, the only body really that's important in terms of creating an environment that works for, uh, works for all. And if we're going to do that, Labour's the only party for that. So like, I've been here before. I was here with Neil Kinnock. I was here with Tony Blair. I didn't walk away from that fight. Uh, I've never walked away from a fight in my life. Now's the time to put on your gloves and get in the ring. Uh, but you do that and you do that not by ranting and shouting or throwing things in from outside. You do that in a positive way, in my view, sitting at the table, having those discussions and winning the argument for it, winning the argument inside the party, but also winning the argument in every workplace that we organise in, back in our communities, down the pub, on the bus, in our homes. This is a debate about what sort of society do we want to be COVID, Brexit, climate, all of these challenges give us the opportunity to do that. And we're missing that opportunity right now. Our silence is deafening. Our inability to step up to government failure is deafening. And it's sad. It's sad. This is my party. And I'm saddened by the fact that we're not kicking back on the obscenity of billions of pounds of taxpayers' money being handed over to the private sector. And now we've got a Tory party riding the waves on the polls on the back, ironically, of our wonderful NHS, 
our NHS delivering a vaccine program, the public sector, public funded, public body that they so desperately have tried to, you know, privatise uh, over generations now as best as they can. It's the single biggest victory that Labour has ever achieved, uh, our National Health Service. And the Tories are riding eye on that. And all these other things are just, uh, you know, fading away with, without a challenge from Labour. And that's incredibly uh, bad from a policy point of view from Labour, but it's a, a, an awful position to be in, in my view, and we need to put that right. Amen, Steve.